Presented by Caltech. Hello, I am Jean-Laurent Rosenthal, the Chair of the Division of Humanities and Social Sciences at Caltech. It's a pleasure and an honor to introduce the speaker for tonight's Ernest C. Watson Lecture Series, Professor Michael Alvarez. Professor Alvarez received his bachelor degree from Carleton in 1986 and his PhD in political science from Duke University in 1992. He then joined the Caltech faculty as assistant professor of political science and was promoted to professor in 2002. Professor Alvarez's research, like so many of our colleagues, tackles difficult problems that span several disciplines. In Mike's case, he applies tools from applied statistics, computer science, and neuroscience to important problems in political science. Mike has also been a committed mentor to undergraduates and graduate students alike, winning teaching awards and serving as director of graduate studies with great success. Rather than enumerate the many dozen articles and handful of books that Mike has written, allow me a personal reading of Professor Alvarez's Vita. He has had a very long standing in voting participation and the impact on political institutions on who votes. In the 1990s and early 2000s, he used a variety of techniques to ferret out the implication that voters in elections are at best partly informed and not particularly keen on getting informed. In recent years, Mike has split his work in two equally important parts. His continuing study of institutions voting outcomes in recent years has led him to study the complicated ballot procedures deployed in countries like Ireland or Uruguay, internet voting in Estonia, the impact of the top two rule in California, and the value of automatic re-registration for people who move within a county in California as well, as well as a variety of issues that involve both participation and election integrity. That work would make him a highly valued political scientist, but at Caltech scholars know no boundaries. Mike has also worked on fundamental issues in voting, voter attitudes, collaborating with neuroscientists to understand the political impact of how people read faces and the impact of changes in information technology on politics, where he both looks at information technologies and uses new machine learning techniques to get at the issues. Tonight, he will bring these different parts of his work together to speak on can America have a safe and secure presidential election. Please join me in welcoming my colleague and friend, Professor Michael Alvarez. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction. Tonight, I'm here to talk about whether or not America can have a safe and secure presidential election. And I just would like to remind everyone who's watching that after um, my presentation, there will be an opportunity for you to uh, pose questions um, and, and I will be available to answer questions and I'm actually looking forward to that. So one question that always comes up is, do we actually study elections at Caltech? And the answer to that is, of, of course we do. And, and we've studied elections at Caltech for quite some time. Um, our humanities and social sciences division um, has a fantastic group of social scientists. And a number of the political scientists and some of the other um, social scientists and, and many others at the Institute have worked with us for the last 20 years on the Caltech MIT Voting Technology Project. The project started in the immediate aftermath of the 2000 presidential election, when there were a number of problems that arose in Florida in particular, and our then president, David Baltimore, teamed up with MIT's president, Chuck Vest, to launch the Caltech MIT project, which uh, again involves a unique collaboration between many uh, different uh, social scientists, computer scientists, uh, mechanical engineers, operations uh, research specialists and, and human factors and human subjects specialists as well on both campuses. And it's been a, a great deal of fun to be involved in that. And we've done a great deal of work over the last 20 years um, to really help try to improve not only the study of elections and election administration, but to also help policymakers in states like California, um, throughout our country, and also throughout the world to try to help improve the administration and technology of elections. First, I wanted to talk about some misconceptions about the 2020 presidential election. And the theme here is going to be that just because something can happen, it doesn't mean it's likely to happen. What we really need to talk about with many of the risks that people are talking about in association with this election is really how likely they are to occur. 
And our research sheds an enormous amount of light into the likelihood of many of the problems that are being discussed right now with respect to this election, or many of the potential problems. The first misconception that I'd like to talk about is that universal or widespread voting by mail are going to generate, necessarily generate opportunities for fraud. Now, our research, um, and one example of it here is the book that, that I uh, edited with my uh, colleague Susan Hyde and, and Thad Hall. Uh, we've done an enormous amount of research on the topic of election and voting fraud in the United States and also abroad. And in the U.S., the incidence of election fraud or voting fraud is extremely low. It's very, very rare to see election fraud in the U.S. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, and that doesn't mean it doesn't happen with respect to absentee or vote-by-mail ballots. But it's extremely rare. As far as we know, it's, it's always caught. And the penalties associated with committing election or voting fraud are very severe. It's also a matter of scale. Now, in a presidential election or even a statewide election, the scale of a fraud scheme that would be necessary to sway the outcome of the election in a state, or certainly at the federal level, is, is so large, it would require a vast conspiracy and a very uh, a huge amount of coordination between many, many individuals. And it's you know, that kind of issue, the scale, is one of the things that, that we think minimizes the risks associated with uh, widespread absentee voting or vote-by-mail fraud. It would be very, very hard for a large group of people to engage in that kind of conspiracy without being caught. So the risks associated with fraud, in particular with respect to absentee and voting by mail, we think are relatively low. A second misconception is that the electronic voting machines will be hacked. And, and again, here's a, a cover of a book that I wrote also with my colleague Thad Hall about electronic voting. Now, Electronic voting machines and voting machines in general are vulnerable. They are vulnerable to hacking and attacks of various sorts. And those attacks have been shown in many studies, in particular in laboratories. But the real significant threat to voting machines and in-person voting, especially in this election, isn't hacking. It's really the machine malfunctions and machine unavailability for in-person voters. This is a sort of issue that we've seen time and time again throughout the United States and abroad with in-person voting. The machines can break, and they do. Uh, they are generally relatively fragile devices. Uh, many, many people are using them simultaneous or, or, or in, in, in sequence. And things just tend to happen. And, and, and it's those malfunctions, and when the machines malfunction, their unavailability, that creates frustrations, long lines, and problems in polling places, not hacking. Also keep in mind that in 2020, most people are likely to be casting a ballot by mail, uh, or they're gonna take a by mail ballot or, or a ballot that they've applied for via the absentee process and bring it in and drop it off at a polling place or voting center or in a Dropbox location. So there will be very relatively few people in this election who are gonna be voting in person on electronic voting machines, which also lowers the security problem. And there are many mechanisms currently in place throughout the country, um, physical security, uh, procedural security, and strong forms of auditing in many states, which will help prevent and detect any sort of security problems if they arise. So again, this second misconception is we don't think that, that the threat of hacking is a very serious threat. It's a threat, but it's not the biggest concern that we have going into this election in November. A third misconception regards uncertainty or blue shifts, which I'll talk about in a second, um, on election day and in the immediate aftermath of the election. A blue shift is something that we've studied extensively at Caltech. And we've written a, a paper um, with a PhD student um, and an undergraduate at Caltech, it's currently under review, that um, delineates what the blue shift is. What happens in, in states like California, where we have many people who are voting by mail, or who are casting late ballots, either because they're dropping them off at vote centers or polling places on election day, or they're showing up to vote in person and not being on the registration rolls and casting a provisional ballot. 
Those ballots are ones that, that are, are oftentimes uh, tabulated in the days and perhaps even weeks after an election. The research that we've done indicates that early votes oftentimes, those who cast early votes, oftentimes tend to be more likely to be Republicans. So on election night, the initial tabulation of election results will oftentimes lean towards Republican candidates in close elections. As those late arriving votes arrive, typically from uh, Democratic leaning voters, the vote totals then start to swing towards Democratic candidates. Now in the United States, we don't often have many close elections. But when we do have close elections, what can happen with the blue shift is that election results may flip from one party to another, from one candidate to another. And we saw a number of these cases occur in the 2018 midterm elections, in particular in Orange County, California, uh, where we did the bulk of our research. So the blue shift will occur because of late arriving or, or late arriving absentee or late arriving provisional ballots. It's likely to occur. And if it occurs, it doesn't mean that there's fraud or manipulation of the vote totals. What it means is that simply we're just seeing the, the, the different kinds of people who are casting different kinds of ballots. Also, if there's other types of uncertainty in election um, night, uh, for example, um, just a very close election, uh, the uh, media organizations may not call the election on election night. If we go to bed that evening um, or wake up the next morning and the election results are, are not clear and the vote totals are shifting around, that doesn't mean there's election fraud. It doesn't mean there's manipulation occurring. In fact, this is very likely to happen in this election because we all expect that in many of the battleground states, the election is going to be very close. The last misconception is that uh, social media bots and trolls will sway the election. There's been a lot of discussion of social media bots, trolling, and online harassment. It is a significant problem, not only in the US, but worldwide. Platforms like Twitter and Facebook, uh, Instagram and others are actively currently policing their platforms to try to find uh, trollers, bots, harassers, people who are disseminating uh, false and misleading information and to handle those situations and remove that information before it becomes a significant problem. We've done some of that research here at Caltech. Um, in particular, there's a collaboration between my research group and, and research groups in computer science where we've been building mechanisms, methodologies, to try to detect trolls and harassers and, and, and misinformation. Now, we are finding evidence of, of trolling and harassment. Um, but when we look deeply into our data, and we've been collecting Twitter data since 2014, in particular regarding elections, election administration, and election fraud, we find very little evidence of bot activity in those Twitter data. Now, that doesn't mean they don't exist and that they're not trying to disseminate false and misleading information. But the incidence rate of those um, in our data in particular seems to be relatively low. So that minimizes the risk there. But the other thing that, that I wanted to highlight is that in this election, uh, there are very few people in the United States, very few voters, who are undecided. Persuading voters in general is a very difficult enterprise as any, anybody who's ever worked with a political campaign or, or done any political campaigning will, 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 descri will describe. Persuading someone to change their minds is very difficult. And since there are so few undecided voters, in particular so few undecided voters in the critical battleground states, it's very unlikely that any bot activity or misinformation uh, will be received by, by those voters. And if so, it's unlikely that it's going to change their minds. So while these, the activity of bots and trolls and harassers is very important, and it is definitely something we need to be very vigilant about as we go into the November election, we don't think it's uh, something that's going to sway the outcome of this election. So election integrity. Um, I want to switch topics now and talk a little bit more about the work that we do at Caltech and the work that we've done with the Voting Technology Project more generally. We're really focused in this cycle on the integrity of the process. Because as I say here in the slide, trust is very difficult to obtain, but it's very easy to lose. Election administrators and academics who study elections uh, have spent decades trying to build the trust of the American voter in the election administration process and the technologies that we use. Uh, however, we're very concerned that in this election, that false and, and misleading claims about the integrity of the process or the technology may quickly erode the trust and confidence of voters as they go to vote 
or as they watch the vote totals on election night or in the weeks after. So elections need to be free and fair. That's a, an essential principle of democracy, and it really is what undergirds our concerns about election integrity. Traditional approaches to studying the integrity of election are difficult to implement. They're resource intensive. They don't scale very well for, for say, national elections. They aren't timely, and, and oftentimes they aren't very transparent. And here in this photograph, this is me in the primary elections back in the pre-COVID era, uh, actually doing in-person election observation here in Los Angeles County. Now we've done this for almost 20 years um, in Los Angeles County, Orange County, other counties throughout the country, and often and in many cases in, in other countries. What we do is we send teams of students um, who are trained, of course, to go to polling places and to, to just observe the actions of, of voters, to, to watch election officials and, and poll workers and vote center staff as they help voters through the process, to look at the technology that's being used, to examine the layout and, and the availability of parking. Now, those are very, very important tools for studying election integrity. However, like I say, they don't, they don't scale well. They're very, very resource intensive. And in this particular environment this fall, they may very well be difficult, if not impossible, to implement. I do plan on being myself being out on election day and in early voting periods to try to do some limited election observation activities. But given the COVID situation, our students aren't on campus, and, and I would not you know, be taking students um, out, if, even if they were, because of, of the COVID situation. So it's unlikely that we're gonna be able to do a significant amount of, of in-person election observation in this cycle. So what are we gonna do instead? Well, first off, we need to identify what the risks are. Where are we gonna target our, our observation efforts? Where are we gonna target our studies um, as we move into October and November? Rather than focusing on some of the risks that, that I've already identified as being relatively low, what are some of the issues that are, are likely to cause significant potential risk and significant potential harm in early voting with respect to vote by mail and also on election day? Now, one of the biggest concerns that we have is that vote by mail voters will make mistakes on their ballots. Now, these are two examples of spoiled ballots from New Mexico. We did a project many years ago where we had access to a large number of uh, ballots that were cast in uh, uh, congressional elections in New Mexico. And we were helping the state identify and develop uh, strong post-election um, ballot auditing procedures. And these are, again, two examples of uh, real interesting and significant mistakes that led these ballots to be spoiled in person voting. Uh, on the left, at least on the left of my screen, you'll see a situation where a voter has marked both of the choices. They put an X through it and they've written something next to it. Now, if that gets scanned, um, that's going to probably be scanned as an overvote. Um, and, that, and that voter's vote won't be easily tabulated by any kind of scanning voting machine. Uh, hopefully, um, overvoted ballots might be identified for further scrutiny in an election jurisdiction like this, but it's a sort of, of problem that a vote by mail voter might have. They might make a mistake on their ballot, they might attempt to correct it on the ballot, and that might in, in some sense invalidate the vote that they're trying to cast. If you do this, by the way, on your absentee or vote by mail ballot, what you should do is request an, uh, an immediate replacement ballot if you can. Uh, that's the way to, to resolve these errors. Don't, don't try to fix them on the ballot because it could lead to other problems downstream. The ballot on the right is another example. Um, here we have um, a voter who's uh, you know, written in some information. Um, they've uh, you know, marked um, a variety of different uh, uh, places on the ballot and by, by writing in sometimes um, on ballots like this, that can oftentimes spoil the ballot because as you note, they vote for one candidate and then they write in the name of the candidate. And that can lead to problems as well when these ballots are tabulated. So we're concerned about voters making simple mistakes like these on their ballots. So that is a real risk. And again, I just showed you some examples of what those, what those problems look like on ballots. And first off, we're really concerned about mistakes, errors, and duplicate records and voter registration data. Um, in past work that we've done on the Voting Technology Project, We've estimated that somewhere between three to 5% of, of voters in past elections may have had trouble when they tried to vote or try to get an absentee ballot because of simple mistakes in voter registration data. 
That's a significant risk in this election, in particular if there are mistakes in the voter registration data sets that are leading uh, ballots to be sent to, say, incorrect addresses, or there's other information that, that is incorrect um, in the voter registration data, leading to, you know, maybe voters not getting their ballot, um, ballots being sent to the wrong place, or, or other issues um, when they try to, to obtain an absentee ballot. Voters are going to make mistakes on their ballots, as I've already shown you. Um, and we think that that could be as much as, as many as, as 1%, um, 2%, of uh, absentee ballots and vote by mail ballots minimally uh, could have these kinds of errors on them. It could be greater. Uh, again, in many states, there'll be voters who have not voted by mail in the past. Um, they may not be familiar with these kinds of ballots or the process. And we do expect to see a, a significant number of ballots that, that may be have races invalidated on them um, and, and which may not um, be included um, in certain race tabulations. We're also very concerned about delays in the return, uh, in the sending and return of ballots by mail. Uh, we all have, have heard over the last uh, few weeks and few months about some of the issues that the U.S. Postal Service has encountered with uh, mail delivery and delays in mail delivery. We anticipate that those delays um, could uh, cause significant problems um, as we get closer to Election Day. Uh, voters may not receive their ballots on time. Uh, the, those voters who drop their, their ballot in a mailbox or take it to their post office uh, may have see that their ballot is delayed in delivery. There's going to be an enormous volume of mail that will go through the U.S. postal system uh, in October and November, and much of it election-related, not just ballots, but also other campaign material and, and, and voter information booklets. And, and so we do anticipate that a, a few percent of voters may not either get their ballot on time or may have difficulty returning their ballot in a timely manner. We're also anticipating that when it comes to in-person voting, like we have seen in past elections, in recent elections especially, that if people go to vote in person, they may encounter lines. Um, in the past few cycles, we have seen long lines, including long lines here in Los Angeles County in the March primary earlier this year. With uh, precinct consolidation or, or a few, uh, lesser number of vote centers, uh, people's options to vote in person may be limited. With the pandemic, um, the, the process of voting in person uh, is likely to be much slower than it has been in the past with the need for social distancing. And so we're anticipating that there could very well be long lines on, on election day, which could lead some voters to just turn away and walk away, um, thereby affecting turnout. Long lines can also create other problems in polling places. They simply can create headaches. Um, they can you know, frustrate uh, the, the people who work there. They can frustrate voters and produce other problems. If voters feel like they're rushed, they may make mistakes in their ballots. And so we're very concerned about long lines in polling places. And last, as I've talked about before, we do anticipate that there are gonna be significant delays in the reporting of election results on election night. There may very well be uncertainty on election night as to who the next president will be. There's definitely going to be uncertainty about state and federal uh, legislative races. Uh, and, and that is a very significant risk because those delays and, and uncertainties associated with who's winning the election um, could have very significant consequences for voter and stakeholder confidence in this election. So how do we monitor and how do we study these types of risks? Well, the project that we've been working on since 2018, uh, we call Monitoring the Election. And what we're trying to do with this, this project here at Caltech is to try to build strong data science techniques that can in real time monitor um, these kinds of problems to try to detect them at scale, to try to prevent and mitigate the problems if we can, and, and to give some transparency associated with respect to the research that we're doing, but also with these problems as they arise by putting our reports as quickly as we can and, and as much information as we can about what we're seeing in the data and in person on our website. Uh, you can see here on the, on the right in the photograph, this is a, a photograph from a mock election that occurred here in Los Angeles County um, where one of the, the, the vote machines on the ballot um, marking devices, I had a jam and, and, and that's actually a reflection of me taking the picture there. Um, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to monitor these kinds of problems, again, at scale, using modern data science techniques. 
And our project really is intended to first give feedback to election officials who we're working with so that they can detect and also resolve many of these problems when they occur, but to also provide um, data and information to voters and stakeholders and the media um, about what we're seeing in, in these elections and about what we're observing as we study these real risks in the 2020 presidential election. So I'm gonna talk about a few of these techniques and, and methodologies, starting first with registration data. What we're trying to do is we're trying to help election officials here in Southern California, in California more generally, and in a number of other states, in particular Oregon, to try to build accurate databases, which they can use in, in, with uh, a, a great deal of confidence this fall, but to also monitor those databases for administrative errors and perhaps hacking. So what's under the hood with our voter registration monitoring system? What we do is we work closely with election officials to obtain what we call snapshots of the voter registration data. We obtain these usually directly from election officials. Um, in the case of Orange County and Los Angeles County, we get daily snapshots. Um, they pass these to us either weekly or monthly, um, but we're getting a, a view of the voter registration database as it changes every day. In the case of states, large states like California, where the database has uh, 21 million records in it or so, or Oregon, we get these data weekly. And we feel that's a sufficient degree of granularity to accurately monitor them. The first thing that we do is we take a snapshot and we look for duplicate records. We look for exact matches, which are exact duplicates. We also use fuzzy matching to try to identify likely duplicate records. The second thing that we do is we, de de we compare snapshots um, from today to say yesterday to try to see how much volatility, how much change there has been in the file. These would be things like new records being added, records being dropped, or records that have some field changed. Uh, this is, can be evidence of uh, um, administrative issues or errors that may be creeping into the data. It could also be an early warning device to help uh, election officials detect potential meddling in their files. And so the change analysis is very important to the election officials we work with. We also then, once we build up these databases of, of uh, duplicate records over time, or changed uh, records over time. Like in the case of Orange County, we've been doing this on daily records since early 2018. We then apply statistical anomaly detection to try to winnow out the false positives, to try to identify days and periods of time when the change rates or the duplicate record rates seem to be statistically anomalous so that we can report back to the election officials about those days and those, those issues. And they can then launch further investigation to just determine exactly what was happening and to determine forensically um, if any steps need to be taken to either correct records in the file or to make administrative changes in how they're handling the incoming data. So that's what's under the hood. Now, the first thing that we found when we started this project is that these data sets are amazingly dynamic. They're not static at all. Um, oftentimes you may think that, that administrative data controlled by say our state government or a county agency is very static. Well, in fact, the voter registration file is incredibly dynamic. This is a view of the voter registration uh, file in Orange County going back to when we started the project in 2018. And I understand that the, the um, legends are very small here, but on the, on the far left at the beginning of this time series, this is early 2018. At the far right um, is June of this year. And this graph just shows you the number of new records that are being added in Orange County. Uh, on a weekly basis. And you can see that the number of new records, obviously it, it spikes right before um, elections, but there's an enormous amount of new records that are being added in a weekly, uh, weekly to just the database in Orange County. Uh, LA County's larger, so the, the number of records being added in LA County is, is significantly larger. And if you, if you aggregate this up to the state level, you get a sense for the, the challenge that election officials face and you get a sense for um, how interesting it is from a data science perspective for us to be analyzing these, these snapshots um, using our, our computational systems in the cloud. So what do we do when we check for duplicate records? Um, duplicates are a significant problem in these data sets, as I've already alluded to, 
because they can, they can result in, in vast inefficiencies. If there are a large number of duplicate records in the data, um, that could mean that election officials and those who are using these data uh, may be sending out much more mail than they need to. Uh, it can lead to other problems like, uh, you know, these data sets are used for, for drawing precinct lines, uh, for allocating voting equipment to precincts. So it can lead to other kinds of inefficiencies or problems um, administratively. Duplicate records also can lead to, to um, erosion of voter confidence. I mean, if a large number of voters, for example, receive two ballots in their mailbox, uh, you know, that could lead many voters to question uh, what's happening with the data set, what's happening with the voter, um, with the absentee voting process. And that's definitely a situation we'd like to avoid. So you can see here, these are just examples that I've made up. And you can see in just these simple examples that, that there are some exact duplicates, but there are some, some near misses. Uh, finding the exact duplicates is relatively easy to do, even in large data sets. And in fact, the uh, the voter registration system, the database system here in California is set up to automatically find the exact matches using this very information. And here you can see that, that there are two records that are identical, and that's an exact match. And, and as I said, those are relatively easy to find, and those are relatively easy for election officials at the state or county level to resolve. Fuzzy matching is harder. It's harder computationally, especially in, in large voter registration data systems like in California, which have maybe 21 million records. What we do is we use algorithms that, that try to identify strings that are very, very similar, but they're not exactly the same. Like you can see some examples here um, in, in, in this particular um, slide. It's computationally difficult to do this. Um, it, these, these algorithms um, do take an enormous amount of time to run. Um, especially on large data sets where you're, you're looking at multiple dimensions, um, trying to match across different fields. And it's also really hard to explain when you try to explain these to, say, the Secretary of State of California or people um, in the office about how fuzzy matching works. But it turns out that fuzzy matching is very important um, to election officials because exact matches, again, are easy to find, but the, the near matches indicate that there might be a mistake of some sort. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that people can spell their names. There could be simple differences in how uh, someone has written down their address. And there can also be uh, slight mistakes in even sensitive identifiers like a driver's license or social security number. So the process that we've built that helps the Secretary of State's office and also the local uh, county election officials in Southern California to use fuzzy matching to identify these near uh, uh, exact matches uh, have been very helpful um, this summer uh, they have uh, been able to identify a large number of potential matches and resolve those um, to clean the files up considerably as we go into the, their, their most important use, which would be sending out absentee ballots and in, in vote-by-mail ballots in the very near future. So we're, we're using these kind of techniques here in Southern California and in California. We use public release data. Um, so, you know, the, if you've registered to vote recently, you know that, that if you've been at the DMV, um, you know, your driver's license or state identification number um, is associated with your voter registration uh, record. Uh, there's also, uh, for most records, uh, the last four of the social. We do not use that information in the work that we do at Caltech because that information is so sensitive, uh, we prefer not to, to, to use it. What we do is we, we do exact and probabilistic matching using the slightly less accurate public release information. We identify then a superset of potential matches which we pass then to the election officials so that they can add in the more exact and precise identifiers like the driver's license, state ID, or social security number to reduce the number of potential false positives in the exact and fuzzy matching. I know that sounds complicated, but that's a, a, we feel a, a very secure and relatively efficient way where we can really help election officials here in California to resolve these duplicate records uh, because they simply don't have the facilities the computational power, the personnel resources, or the knowledge of how to, how to do fuzzy matching um, in today's modern computing, computing environment. So we've been working on this over the summer and it's been a very, very productive uh, collaboration. Here's some data from Orange County. Um, you can see here at the, in the top, these are new duplicate records that have been added um, into the file. This is uh, data from 2018. Uh, the bottom figure shows the rate of deduplication. 
And what's very interesting about these two time series is that you can see that there's, a, there's actually a pretty interesting correlation here where the deduplication rate is correlated with a slight lag um, with the duplication rate. But you also see the extent of the problem. Um, you can see that there are periods of time where there are uh, a relatively significant number of duplicate records that are being added to the file. And our techniques um, are helping election officials here in Southern California and in California resolve these records more efficiently. Now, the other thing I talked about is anomaly detection. So how do we do anomaly detection? Here's, here's some, uh, a graph from Orange County. Um, you can see in the, the first two panels, uh, that's, those are the number of records added. This is data from 2018. Uh, you can see the number of records that are, are dropped and changed. And in the bottom six panels, you can see the number of records that have some field that has been changed. The red dots indicate uh, days where there are a statistically significantly higher rate of change in each of these different dimensions. And these are days where, you know, we simply write a report, and here we send it to Orange County, and we said these are the days and these are the, the areas where we have identified that there are relatively higher rates of change in these different fields, which they then investigate. Um, and in each of these instances, uh, they have determined that, you know, th these were perfectly normal um, administrative activities that were occurring um, in the file for, for various reasons. Um, in particular, you see the, the spike um, in the record change file. You know, that was, that was about the time of, um, of an election. So, you know, again, we're not identifying in some of these fields a large number of anomalous changes. Um, but in some fields, we do see a relatively high rate, and this is very useful intelligence for election officials. So how do we uh, eliminate the need for in-person election observation? Well, we've been pioneering the use of social media, in particular Twitter, um, to crowdsource election monitoring. We've been doing this since 2014. Uh, what we do is we continuously collect from the Twitter API uh, all the tweets that we can that relate to different election type, type election problems including election day voting, voter fraud, remote voting, voter ID, polling place voting, and other kinds of polling place operations. Now in 2018, this monitor ran from August uh, 5th to uh, December 12th, and it collected 29 million unique tweets from over 3.6 million unique accounts. And I'll tell you right now, these election monitors are running, they've been running for quite some time, uh, and we're collecting an enormous amount of Twitter data. We then analyze these tweets by different issues, by geography, and in other ways to try to identify locations and, and, and types of problems that might be occurring. Uh, we can geocode many of these tweets. Uh, geocoding is, is an interesting problem that we're working um, uh, quite a bit on. Well, we can geocode many of them, especially to the state level, so that we can identify what voters and others are saying about the elections in states as they occur. So of the 29 million tweets we had, we were able to geocode um, about 19 and a half million of them uh, to, to states and, and in some cases even to larger counties. Now this is data from 2018 and you can, you can get a sense for how, how this data varies over time and by topic. Uh, and you'll see of course that in the, in the period before the 2018 election, this was the, the, the midterm election in the fall, there wasn't a lot of conversation about these problems until we approached the opening of early voting and voting, the voting by mail period in many states where we see a spike of traffic on election day voting and election day voting topics, as well as uh, tweets about election fraud. And you can see again that both of those topics do spike again on election day. Um, and in particular, the spike in tweets about election fraud was of concern to our team. This is a, an image of what the, the traffic looked like on election day, and we will be having this exact same live streaming monitor launching relatively soon on our website for tweets that are, that are coming in for the 2020 presidential election. You can see that over time, over the course of election day um, in 2018, there was a quite a bit of variety um, in, in what people were talking about on Twitter. Um, again, there was a, a lot of conversation in 2018 about election fraud which again, we were curious about and investigated. You can see that on election day, um, in the morning, of course, there's not much Twitter traffic to begin with, but as the day progressed and as we got closer and closer to um, election eve, the uh, tweets about um, election fraud um, continued to grow and to spike. This is a simple word cloud, and this is the first step in, in the analysis of these kind of data where we're looking at the hashtags and you can see that, that people who were tweeting about election fraud in 2018 
were concerned about voter suppression. Uh, they were concerned about election day voting. But in particular, if you look closely, you'll see that there are certain states in certain places that are being mentioned, like Texas. And in particular, there are a number of hashtags and also keywords that we found that are associated with the state of Georgia. Now, those of you who follow elections may remember that in 2018, there were lots of concerns about voter suppression and election fraud in Georgia. And our Twitter data, I think, has been very useful in helping to find those problems. Now, the other thing that we do is we also do anomaly detection in elections data. Uh, here's a simple example. Um, one of the things that, that we do is we scrape election returns from state and county websites. Here we had scraped turnout data um, from Orange County as they were reporting um, election results in their uh, uh, hourly on election, on election eve and then after that every day uh, when they were reporting their updates of the election totals throughout the canvas period. The graph on the left simply shows turnout for every precinct that we could get data for. All of the, the Volpe and Mill precincts are, are eliminated from this analysis. The, right, the, the, the line on the right that's in red gives, it indicates where 100% is. And again, you, you, you would probably not um, you know, be surprised to know that precincts shouldn't have more than 100% turnout unless something is going wrong. Now the graph on the right shows the same histogram except on the last day of the canvas. And so what's, being, what's happening is that from early in the canvas period on the left to later in the canvas period on the right, increasing number of votes are being added to the tallies. And you see the distribution simply shift to the right where the reported turnout rates are, are increasing. But we do see these two anomalous precincts. Now when we identify these precincts um, immediately um, right after the election, we quickly notified um, our colleagues down at the Orange County uh, Register of Voters Office. They investigated these two precincts because of course we know which two they are. And they were, they were able to find quickly that the, the misreports of turnout here were due to administrative error. This wasn't ballot box stuffing, it was simply administrative errors that occurred in these two precinct or polling place locations. Uh, and of course all that's happening over time towards the end of the canvas period is that there are just more uh, votes being added to the, uh, the, the totals, the numerators, um, in both of these uh, polling places. This was very, very useful to Orange County because we quickly and, and in a very early uh, place identified these problems. They were able to investigate them so that when, and we put the report on our website, so that when the news media and others noticed these anomalies in the data, um, they were able to quickly respond, um, able to point out that, that the team at Caltech had already investigated these problems unable to resolve this uh, without any significant erosion in voter confidence or, or any concerns being raised about the integrity of the election. We've also done a lot of work on the blue shift in elections. And these are data also from Orange County. Uh, the, the graph at the top shows the cumulative number of ballots that are tabulated for by mail voting and for polling place voting in Orange County in 2018. The, uh, the dashed line in the graph here indicates the final report on election night. So the, the, the points to the left of that are uh, election night reports. The points to the right of that are the days um, and weeks also following the election and the election reports. And what's important about this graph is you can see where the blue shift comes from. Um, you know, on election night um, and through the last tabulation on election night, a lot of the ballots that are being tabulated are, are vote by mail ballots. But there's an increasing influx of polling place ballots that starts to get mixed in. And, and that's part of where the, the shift in the vote totals comes from. We're seeing different mixtures of voters whose votes are being tallied throughout election eve. And then in the days following the election, we see a continued slight rot increase in ballots from polling places that are, that are being tabulated. Those are mainly provisional ballots, which oftentimes do come from Democratic leaning voters. And late arriving, vote by mail ballots, which also tend to come from, from Democratic leaning voters. Now the graph on the right um, gives you some sense for, for kind of what the blue shift looks like in, in Orange County. These are the, the precinct level vote share differences, uh, the Democratic candidate versus, minus the Republican candidate for the gubernatorial race in Orange County in November 2018 in the general election, uh, about a thousand precincts. Uh, for election night uh, versus the end of the post-election canvas. Now, were there no blue shift 
um, in the election, we would expect to see that these dots should all line up on that 45 degree line. Well, in fact, they don't. And you can see that there's a slight shift um, in, in every single precinct, some, some precincts it's greater than others. Um, not every single precinct, but most precincts are shifting. Um, and that's where the blue shift comes from. We're seeing this, this shift in most precincts uh, where the vote totals are moving towards the Democratic candidate in the gubernatorial race. So we can do analyses like that that also help election officials um, as they grapple with uh, questions and concerns in, as, as people see these vote totals moving on election night. So what do we do um, to, to help assure election security and integrity? As I've said, there are many misconceptions um, on social media and even in, in the mass media, in the newspapers and on TV about this election. Uh, assuring the security and integrity of this election means helping to safeguard the data, helping to monitor the technology, and also helping to monitor the process as the election unfolds. What we're trying to do is we're trying to provide some degree of assurance that as independent researchers, uh, we are studying and monitoring the security and integrity um, of the process through our auditing and forensic techniques and through the transparency that, that we hope to bring to this by posting our results as quickly as we possibly can uh, to a website and making our, our data and research available uh, to the public. And if we can do all of these things, uh, I'm very confident that we can have a safe and secure election this November. But what is you as a voter, what, what can you as a voter do to help ensure the integrity of this election? The first uh, recommendation that we have is that if you do get your ballot by mail, um, please, please mark it carefully. Check it a number of times. Make sure that, that you haven't made any simple mistakes like overvoting and undervoting. And if, you, if you've made mistakes that need correction, uh, request a, 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 a new ballot. Follow the instructions very carefully. Make sure that you fill out any information that's required on the envelope, um, in particular your signature, before you return it. And if you can return it using a ballot drop box in your county or state, we recommend that you do so. If you can return it to a polling place or a vote center safely, we recommend that you do so. Those ballots are, are likely to, to end up in the tabulation stream quickly. If you have to send it by, US, by the U.S. Postal Service, take it to a post office um, if you can safely and drop it uh, securely in a postal box in the post office. If your state or local jurisdiction allows you to track your vote by mail or absentee ballot, many do, use that. Uh, you can know exactly where your ballot's at and many election officials um, will use these systems to notify voters if there are problems associated with the receipt or with their ballot. If you wanna go and vote in person, um, if you have the opportunity to do that in the days before the election, we recommend that you do it before the election if you can. We recommend that you try to go off peak, in other words, go late morning or maybe mid afternoon. Make sure to bring your, your personal protective gear um, and make sure to bring your sample ballot if you have one. That'll help uh, speed the process uh, as you check in and, and as you uh, can use it to uh, mark your ballot. But above all, we, we really recommend patience. Uh, we recommend patience if you're voting by mail and tracking your ballot. We recommend patience if, if you're going to vote in person. And most importantly, we recommend patience on election night uh, because we are expecting um, a very slow and long election night. So thank you. And again, there, there will be an opportunity right now um, following this, this talk to um, have a Q&A and I welcome your, your questions and I will try to answer them as, as best as I can. And I do wanna just thank um, a number of uh, groups and organizations and individuals for helping us with this project. It's a very complicated project. Uh, the John Haynes and Dora Haynes Foundation um, has helped us with financial support and we've received significant computational support from Google. Uh, there are a lot of students here at Caltech who've been involved in this project, and I want to thank all of them, both, both past and present. And I give, want to give a special thanks to Neil Kelly in Orange County, to Dean Logan in Los Angeles County, and Alex Padilla in the Secretary of State's office, and the many people in their, in their staff and their teams who have helped us enormously as we've worked with them to learn how the process works and to obtain data from them. Thank you.